So uh, with that, I would love to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Meyer, who is the co-founder of International Network. This is a volunteer network of uh, crisis mappers and also the director of uh, crisis mapping and partnership with the Yushahidi platform. Uh, Pat is the director of, um, um, has been there previously, also has co-directed the Harvard's uh, program on crisis mapping and early warning. Um, has worked on international organizations like the United Nations and also, as many of you know, he, if you've seen some of his TED talk or TED, TEDx talks in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, last year. And, uh, and also he works, um, the, his work was publicly recognized by ex-president Clinton in 2010 for the great work he's been doing, for example, in Kenya and other um, the, with Haiti and other things that he's been uh, very active on. Um, he has a PhD from uh, Fletcher School and also pre-doc from Stanford and, ma and Master of, um, of Art from Columbia University. And if you uh, haven't done so, please, I would uh, you know, encourage you to read his blog on iRevolution.net. It's really, really um, a great work there. So with, with that, I'll turn it over to Pat. I just want to th thank you very much. Um, John and, and also Taha, you've been inspiring to me in many different ways and it's great to be here. Thank you for making the time. I know it's hard. There's so many other things going on in the work day and the work week and so on. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, I'll start out with a confession. I am, I am not a public health expert. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but the field of public health was really instrumental a few years back to getting me hooked and totally sparking my interest in this broader area of, of crisis mapping. And in fact, it was in 2006 when Larry Brilliant gave his TED talk that I watched online that really was a huge turning point for me. He was talking about early detection, early response for digital, for disease uh, surveillance and so on. I'd never heard anything like this, but I was trying to do something similar in the conflict side uh, with complex humanitarian emergencies and so on and trying to do digital conflict detection. And when I saw what was possible with GFIN, and then since, I've been trying to follow and keep abreast as best as possible in terms of the advances in your field, I've just been continuously blown away and really looking to, well, what is this field of digital disease detection? What are the experts, many of you are here today, doing? And what can we learn in the field of humanitarian response and conflict prevention and conflict early warning and conflict early response from all the amazing advances that are going on in, in your field? So it really is a huge huge deal for me to be here six years later after having been inspired by this field and to basically continue learning from you. Um, I've looked at the lineup. I kept on looking at the speaker lineup over the past few weeks. And I'm just absolutely psyched to see the, the presentations that are going to be happening with the Ignite Talks as well as the panels and so on, this panel of speakers and uh, the topics. So I will definitely be bringing a lot of what I'm going to be learning over the next two days, the insights back to the field of crisis mapping, conflict prevention, conflict early warning, try and help cross-fertilize all that. So in the meantime, however, I've been asked by John and the organizing committee, including uh, Taha, to share with you some lessons from this new field of, of crisis mapping. And again, I think the purpose here is really to cross-fertilize, to share lessons learned and best practices, perhaps, from our respective fields. So it's bi-directional in that sense. Um, so what I propose to do is to share with you three concrete case studies of crisis mapping in action, and then to conclude with some of the lessons that we've learned over the past couple of years and to try to share these with you and maybe use this as a springboard for the conversation, the brainstorming that we can have after the slide presentation. So to start with, uh, jump right into it, a couple of years ago, as you know, the devastating earthquake struck Haiti. I happened to have friends at the time who were there doing research. I found out about the news maybe an hour after it took place on CNN. And I was in Blake, I was in, uh, sorry, Tufts University at the Fletcher School uh, watching the news, and I had no idea whether these friends of mine, very close friends of mine, were still uh, alive or not. And I, I did freak out. It was an emotional reaction. I didn't know what to do, but I happened to work for this uh, group called Ushahidi, which is Swahili for witness, and we developed these free and open source mapping platforms for sort of crowdsourced mapping, live mapping. So I figured, well, I can't bear watching the news. I've got to do something to distract myself. I happen to be the director of crisis mapping for Ushahidi, I'm just going to map. And so this is what the map looked like that first night. Uh, got online, looked at Twitter, uh, found some Twitter users in Port-au-Prince who were starting to tweet about what they were seeing and about the, the impact of the disaster. And when they provided geographical information, I was able to then, with a couple of friends, map that information. I didn't actively interact with them. I was sort of just curating information that was coming out. What's 
remarkable is that 10 days later, the head of FEMA, Craig Fugate, on a public tweet says, oh, well, this map is the most comprehensive uh, and up-to-date map available to the humanitarian community. And when we saw it, we're like, whoa, what? Um, that was not the intention. And in fact, what's, I think, remarkable um, about this initiative in some respects is that it's, it wasn't really professionals who were behind this, uh, this initiative, right? It was not a formal professional humanitarian organization or professional humanitarians uh, in any respect. In fact, it started in my living room in snowy Boston, some 1,500 miles away from Haiti with a bunch of friends in grad school. Because after a couple days, I couldn't keep up, nor could my colleagues at Ushahidi keep up with the information flow, which I'm sure you're also familiar with in terms of the fire hose when it comes to digital disease detection. Uh, we didn't have any fancy tools or know about any fancy tools, so I reached out to these friends uh, at Fletcher, and by the end of the week, we had trained some 150 volunteers, both graduate students and undergraduate students, on how to do live mapping, and we were making it up, to be completely honest, as we went along. None of us had done anything like this before. We were just writing the, the, the guidebook, if you'd like, um, every day. And I want to share just a short video. Hopefully this will work. Maybe, maybe not. Here we are, at least I am, in Washington, D.C., using this innovation coming from Africa to try to help people in Haiti and leveraging volunteers all around the world. I mean, it's really a flattened world. And so as we started to work together, realizing here's a great example of ordinary people together doing an extraordinary thing. We had an urgent request for a school in near Carfor Foy, hundreds of trapped children. The SAR team had originally been sent out by UN dispatch. They'd gotten to the location and realized it was a wrong location. And I ended up being able to give them an extremely accurate location and a SAR team made it out and um, they, they managed to rescue um, some of the children that were, were trapped in that. I'm mapping the relief, but it's, it's really hard and totally heartbreaking to be reading these messages. You, you, it's literally life and death situations. People are dying, and the faster you can get people onto the ground, the faster you can get them, get them help. And that's one of the reasons why I'm still here, because we're, it feels like we're really making a difference. And that's what the people on the ground are telling us. So that was Anna, just another you know, regular student who'd never, never, never done anything like that before, who ended up being so incredibly helpful, finding these GPS coordinates and so on. And it was intense work. And because we're talking about health, I will also at the end say a, a few words about mental health. What does it mean as you have these volunteers who are increasingly digital volunteers helping in these kinds of situations? But this is, for example, a screenshot of the map at a certain given moment in time that we were basically creating and adding to. What was really unique about this map in terms of crisis mapping the efforts behind it was that it was a map like no other. It was never looking the same for more than 10, 15 minutes at a time, right? We were continuously adding, curating information from social media, from mainstream media. People were emailing us pictures from Port-au-Prince. We were mapping the pictures. It was continuously uh, changing. And we found out a couple weeks later, even though, again, this was an emotional reaction on our part, um, that the U.S. Marine Corps was using this platform operationally, literally, to send out choppers to go evacuate, to do medical evacuations and so on, of individuals based on some of the information that we were crowdsourcing and then mapping in, real, in near real time on this particular platform. But this really wouldn't have been, I think, as uh, perhaps useful had it not been for really what this picture sort of uh, might reveal, namely the cell phone towers. Clearly, the mass majority of Haitians are not going to be behind a computer or laptop, let alone own one, right? But the diffusion of cell phones in Haiti is particularly high. I've heard figures from DigiCell from like 70 percent, 80 percent. So we knew that, well, if we were going to try and have some impact as we were making this up as we went along, you know, we might want to find out if there was a way to, to tap SMS. So sure enough, the day after the earthquake, a friend of mine, Josh Nesbitt, who's a CEO of Medic Mobile, uh, went on Twitter and said, we're looking for an SMS gateway for this particular map. And the story is that within a couple hours, somebody in Cameroon, who happened to be following Josh's tweet, uh, Twitter feed, uh, 
tweet him back and said, yeah, actually, I have a friend who works with Digicel in Haiti, the largest telecommunications uh, company there. And by the end of the day, we had an SMS shortcode uh, available to us. Now, Josh is not like, he's in his mid-20s. He's just somebody who's helping out, and he believes in this stuff. He was not the State Department. He was not the White House. He was not the UN. But still, as an individual, he was able to use and leverage the Twitter sphere, some contacts, and basically secure an SMS shortcode for us in a matter of hours. Um, and so what we did was launch something called Mission 4636. 4636 with the number of the shortcode. So anybody inside Haiti could text this shortcode for free with their urgent needs as well as their location. We could not triangulate the GPS coordinates and any of that. So it had to be all done manually. And here's a wordle, a graphic of the content of these two of these text messages during the first two weeks. We received several thousand um, during the first few weeks. In fact, more like 10, 20,000. The reason I share this is, is because it's also quite emotional in the sense that you, know, you, you look at one of the most frequent words used here is please. And this is a communities who've just gone through an incredibly traumatic, possibly the most traumatic moment of their lives. They've almost certainly loved, uh, lost a few loved ones and still they're reaching out and they're saying, please. I think that's quite amazing. But the trick here is obviously these text messages did not come to us in English, right? The vast majority of them were in Haitian Creole. We had a few in French, but the vast majority were in Haitian Creole. And none of us volunteers spoke a word of Haitian Creole. And you might have seen in the video that I shared just earlier, uh, one video footage, a piece of um, a friend of mine, Sabina, working with members of the Haitian diaspora in Boston who spent many, many hours with us uh, at Fletcher in the basement where we had set up our situation room, helping us to translate as well as geolocate these text messages because we didn't know Port-au-Prince uh, really well at all, but they obviously did. So they were starting to help. But in order to scale these efforts, a colleague of mine at Stanford started uh, recruiting volunteers online from the Haitian diaspora, but primarily via Facebook, going to different Facebook groups um, that were focused on Haiti and had members of the Haitian diaspora and so on. And sure enough, by the end of the week, he had recruited somewhat, apparently around 1,100 volunteers from 49 different countries around the world who were all uh, Creole-speaking volunteers. And basically, between them, they were able to translate something like 80,000 text messages, completely for free, completely in their own time. And I understand from this colleague at Stanford that the average turnaround time was about 10 minutes. So really, 10 minutes after a text message left a handset in Port-au-Prince, we had that, we, the volunteers, the Haitian diaspora, had those text messages translated and geolocated for the most part, and then automatically pushed to the back end of the Ushidi platform that our volunteers in Boston were then filtering because we didn't map these 80,000 80, text messages. We actually ended up mapping just about 2% of them. But what we, those 2% were the, what we thought were the most urgent life and death uh, text messages that needed the most attention right away. And something to keep in mind here, given that both John and Taha sort of expressed their interest in sharing, my sharing a bit more the volunteer sort of aspect of all of this is these are not just dots in a map. These are real individuals like, you know, like you and I who have plenty of other things to do right, uh, work, school, teaching, what have you. Um, and yet, you know, they're taking time out of their own lives to help thousands of people, thousands of miles away who they will really never meet. It's an incredible story, incredibly powerful, and I think this shows what is possible in terms of using these new technologies, these networked platforms, free and open source tools, and combining them with what is a human, re a really inherently a human reaction, the want to help others in need. And now we can go beyond just a private, sort of reaction watching television and saying, uh oh, this is really too bad. I wish I could help and then you know, move on with life. Now we can maybe do something about it. Uh, and I think this is also a powerful example because we know full well that for following this situation in Syria and in other countries, repressive regimes are starting to use these technologies uh, in sophisticated ways to repress. But we, we should also not lose sight of the fact that they can also be used for good ways uh, and to help save lives as well. So that was the first, you know, the Haiti story, which in many respects sort of, I think is a milestone in, in, for us in crisis mapping. It really started to show what was possible. And it was all reactive. It was certainly not, um, you know, we were not ready for anything like this. Last year, a very different type of crisis started to unfold. In February, the head of the information services section of UN OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, 
got in touch with us and said, okay, they had seen what we had done in Haiti, and they said, right, listen, um, we don't have any of our information management officers in Libya, so we have very little information that we can trust about what the situation is. And as many of you know, in terms of humanitarian response, emergency management uh, experts will need to take decisions regardless of whether the data is there or not to base a decision on. That's not their fault. It's, you know, it's, a, it's the system, it's reality, whatever it is. Um, so they, you know, and they take multi-million dollar decisions that will basically allocate resources, will, dis, will dictate logistics, where the help is going to be sent first, and so on. So for them, the Libya in, in Feb, end of February, early March, was, was literally for them a black box. Um, so they had an option. Take decisions based on a black box, or take decisions based on a, a live crowdsourced map of uh, social media information because they had seen what had happened during the Arab Spring in neighboring Tunisia and Egypt, all this information being shared in near real time uh, in the social media space, YouTube, Flickr, Twitter, and so on. And so they, they got in touch with it and said, well, you, you know, we, we could use a live crowdsourced social media map. And, in, and sure enough, um, after a few, day, a few days later, uh, even the official UN Twitter feed said, right, listen, we can really start using social media for humanitarian response. And this was the map that we put together. And again, this would not have happened had we not you know, mobilized around Haiti and basically shown a potential with these technologies and volunteers. And this was the first time, and in fact, I never expected this would happen for another few years. The UN and you know, large organizations don't change their protocols and their ways of operating that quickly. So I was actually quite stunned that they did such a 180 uh, with respect to this kind of uh, approach. So this was really the first crisis map that had a UN logo on that. And uh, sure enough, it did not only attract OCHA, but the head of the World Food Program, Jose Chirin, tweeted this. Everybody tweets these days, right? Um, that they too could use this map because ultimately what this map was providing was near real-time situational awareness of an unfolding situation, which we know is critical for emergency response. And it was not only the World Food Program, but a number of other humanitarian organizations got in touch with us and asked us for the password to this map because, in fact, this map was not originally uh, public. Uh, when we, we, the volunteers, put this together, um, we went with a password protected option for obvious reasons. Situational awareness is good for the UN. It's good for Qaddafi fighters and loyalists as well. I mean, that's, that's obvious. I mean, there is a level of intelligence that one can glean from these maps when you start curating and aggregating over time and space. You can start seeing patterns. You can start querying the map. So we wanted to be very careful of that. However, a few days after we launched this, uh, our UN colleagues said, well, we still think that a public version might be useful and might let other people um, know what's happening. So we decided to provide a public version that was on a 24-hour time delay. Uh, it could have been 48 hours. It could have been seven days. I mean, we went with 24 hours. Um, and it was heavily redacted. You only had the titles of the events and nothing else. No links, no uh, reference to the original Twitter feed or, or tweet, uh, just really bare bones. We found out um, a few months ago uh, that some colleagues at the International Criminal Court were paying attention to this map. Now, whether that's a good thing or not, and whether we want to make that very public or not is another question because there are going to be repercussions if people start to see that, wait, a bunch of volunteers are creating information that organizations like the UN and the ICC are paying attention to. That could be a problem and something that I'm going to try and expand on in my concluding slide. Obviously, a map on its own with just dots on a map doesn't really help, right? But what we started to do then was provide analysis, basic trends analysis, daily situation reports for our UN colleagues who did not have the time or the bandwidth to basically do their own analysis of the information. I should say, for the first time, crowdsourced, social, crowdsourced information from uh, so the social media space was used in official UN OCHA infographics that were circulated in Tripoli and Benghazi. So they were starting to mix data from the professionals, data from the cloud, if you'd like, in a way that they felt actually created a better picture for the humanitarians on the ground. This had never happened, and I never thought it would happen for at least a few more years. Now, when I say we, I, I do mean we as in some of the volunteers who were involved in Haiti. But what happened after Haiti, you may recall, was the earthquake in Chile. And then a few months later were the massive floods in Pakistan and the, the, the massive um, fires that ravaged Russia 
uh, end of the fall of, of 2010. What was amazing with each of these initiatives after Haiti was you had volunteers who were driving these initiatives, not professionals. So in Chile, we had a few volunteers from Haiti who helped out with Chile with another uh, university, Columbia University. And then in Pakistan, we had all of a sudden far more volunteers from the region, from Pakistan for obvious reasons, who wanted to help out. But you had volunteers from Haiti and Chile teaching our friends in Pakistan how to do live mapping, which we had just learned a few months earlier, even though you know, we were considered the pros, but um, you know, again, we were making this up as we went along. So what we figured at the end of 2010, which was an amazing, uh, disruptive, tragic year at the same time, was our UN colleagues were saying, well, wow, you guys are really onto something here, um, but we need to be able to rely on you. We need to know you're a bit more predictable, and right now you're just nebulous, anonymous volunteers who do organically maybe sort of show up every once in a while. So we decided to create a brand, to be perfectly honest, and to try and make these volunteers have the credit, the, the credit that they deserve. Many of them spend hours and days, weeks, volunteering on these efforts. So we said, right, let's give this a name, the Standby Volunteer Task Force, and let's build this uh, network, let's be more proactive, let's be a standby network, which means by definition we should be ready and on standby. Let's develop our protocols uh, and workflows as we need. And again, developing this has been a, an experiment, right? It's an ongoing experiment. It's R&D. There's no end to this R&D. We're always upgrading. We're always updating our workflows. We decided to organize just in this way. Um, 11 very modular teams, volunteers, anybody can join. will join a team of their interest, maybe because they have a skill set in that area, or maybe they're completely new, but they want to know how to do this. So. The analysis I just showed you, geolocation, that team's one and only purpose is to find GPS coordinates. And they've gotten darned good at finding GPS coordinates for pretty much anything under time pressure. They're really very quite sophisticated. So much so, by the way, that humanitarian professionals from the ICRC as well as the UN are joining this particular network because we also provide training completely for free. We, being volunteers, are providing training to the humanitarian professionals because we happen to have developed skills that are not quite mainstream yet in the humanitarian space. Uh, humanitarian team is simply the team that liaises uh, with the humanitarian organizations and the, the other teams. The media monitoring team is really important. You gotta monitor the media sometimes, social, mainstream media. The reports team publishes, uh, publishes this information on a map. Satellite team is a, new, is a new team that basically does satellite imagery analysis for Amnesty International and recently the World Food Pro, uh, UNHCR in, uh, so in Somalia, basically using microtasking and crowdsourcing of satellite imagery analysis. Um, the SMS team, just like in, in Haiti, task team is just a research team. The technology team are the geeks and the nerds who set up these technologies and ensure that they don't crash at the worst possible time. And then translation, for obvious reasons, we need different languages. And then, importantly, verification. And we've developed certain standards and uh, tactics and strategies to verify crowdsourced social media that I think I'd like to say are pretty darn good. We haven't made them up. A lot of it is learning by doing. But we've put together a 20-page manual on how to uh, verify crowdsourced information that our colleagues at the UK Guardian, Al Jazeera, um, the BBC have all asked copies of, and we're very happy to, it's all open in public. Everything we do is open in public. Every team has its own workflows, predictable, streamlined. Every team has two or four coordinators who are responsible for managing, managing those teams. The person at OCHA who had basically activated the standby task force for Libya sent us an email to thank us, and I wanted to bring your attention to these three points. What we were able to do for OCHA was reduce the information overload, right? The signal to noise ratio, they did not have the time to get 100 people in a room to monitor the media and geolocate this information, right? But, but we did as volunteers. We also produced this uh, information in a, in a format that was more digestible to them, right? A live crisis map. And when you start georeferencing and geolocating information, they become more actionable. You know what's happening and where it's happening to who it's happening and so on. And obviously, why do this, like I hinted to begin with, to create better situational awareness? Does that guarantee better decision making? No, but that's where you know, the pros, um, that's sort of, in a way, their problem. But we're going to try the best to provide them at least with the information um, that they need. All right, the last example is still in Libya. And this one has to do with public health. So I thought I'd, I'd end with this one. On December 12th, and it's actually a uh, project that we haven't shared publicly yet. We're just, we've just blogged about it today. But on December 12th of last year, our colleagues from WHO in Tunisia got in touch with us to request the activation of the standby task force. And I should say we have activation criteria. 
we don't just launch a map because we feel like it. We've got plenty of other things to do. Most of us are full-time professionals or full-time students. So we have certain criteria that need to be met. What they needed to do was basically, they were doing an assessment of the public health situation in Libya uh, after, after the conflict, quote unquote. Uh, what they needed to do was basically put together a GIS layer of the health facilities uh, in Libya, basically create a, a health facility registry. Uh, and this was you know, in partnership with the Libyan government so that they could have this information to start rebuilding the national public health system. The data that what needed to be collected was basically the location of these health facilities, the, their names, um, status, their types, and so on. And they needed this to compare the before and after, right? Before the, the conflict, what did the health system, they had baseline information for that, and they needed to basically look at the, make a gap analysis. And then the resulting analysis and the data were to go to the Ministry of, of Health uh, as basically baseline information in their reconstruction efforts. And they were also supposed to then obviously be of help for future emergencies, for systems analysis uh, and maintenance. So this was just not a, a one-off that would be helpful you know, once, but very much an investment for, for the future. So the problem is you can't just load volunteers whenever the heck you want, right? Um, this was December 12th. And like I said, most of us full-time professionals and or uh, full-time uh, academics teaching or, or taking courses. December 12th, most of us are wrapping up end of year projects. It's incredibly hectic period. And our fellow volunteers who are full-time students are in the, mid in the middle of, of final exams as well. So we weren't really sure if this was going to stick. In a, in a way, this was a worst possible time <laughs> with a winter break to ask for something like this. But we figured, well, we might as well test this out. We have nothing to lose and, you know, WHO is perfectly clear that you know, we're going to try this out and there are no promises here. So you know, as per our own standard operating, operating procedure, we have uh, a Ning.com platform, a customized platform where we organize all our teams, where all our workflows, our training material are. And as per our standard operating procedures, we launched a dedicated page for this deployment on our Ning platform, provides information, uh, contact information for the points of, of contact, uh, coordinators, provides the workflows, provides the rationale information on our partners, the big picture, uh, and so on. And I should say, uh, when WHO reached out to the STEMI task force, they also reached out to our colleagues at GIS Corps and the uh, OpenStreetMap team. Both are volunteer-driven initiatives as well. And these two teams were incredibly uh, uh, pivotal to this whole effort. So we ended up basically developing workflows that were not only just internal to each other's sort of network, but also across networks. Because what our friends at GIS Corps did was basically volunteer uh, many, many hours to clean up the data that we were finding. And then our friends at OpenStreetMap provided the underlying mapping technology to add this information um, and be able to share it geographically. So what we ended up doing was basically setting up a spreadsheet, a uh, Google spreadsheet, and starting the database. And our, sor our sources were anything we could possibly find on the web. Previous data sets from different, uh, you know, different websites, any other information on individual health facilities. And uh, after, I would say, four weeks, we had basically exhausted every source we could possibly have found uh, on the web and had come up with, I think, a pretty good uh, initial database for our colleagues at OpenStreetMap to use. And this was uh, the map which is public. And what we did after four weeks, when we didn't seem to be able to find anything new online, we as a standby volunteer task force phased out. But this led to phase number two in which our friends from OpenStreetMap then modified their platform to allow people in Libya, basically public health experts, uh, medical experts, and so on, to share information themselves, right? So we had looked throughout the cloud, and then when that was exhausted, obviously you go uh, to the professionals on the ground who have a lot more information to complement that. One thing that we did um, that we hadn't done in previous deployments is uh, we wanted to find out how often people were volunteering and also get their feedback on a daily basis, if possible, about how things were going. And the reason was not to, to police anybody, to say, hey, you didn't work enough, you didn't volunteer enough. We're totally not about that. You can volunteer five minutes and never volunteer again. It's, there's no like, you know, guilt tripping or anything. Um, but we wanted to make sure, on the, quite on the contrary, that people would not burn out because we had some serious burnout during the Libya crisis map deployment, and we wanted to try and avoid that from happening again. But it also provided us with daily uh, feedback from the volunteers who were really at the front lines of this, and this was incredibly useful. Uh, and on average, by the way, uh, volunteers spend about an hour, uh, up to about three hours uh, volunteering. 
Um, and the feedback was really important because every day we'd get the feedback and we'd actually modify and adapt based on the feedback we got. People say, well, you know, this doesn't really work. We are, we're having problems. And one of the biggest frustrations was the spelling, finding Arabic, English spellings and trying to reconcile those. And if we didn't get that kind of feedback and try to help out, then I think people have gotten too frustrated and, and stopped. So getting that kind of pulse is really, really important. So at the end of this, our colleague, the, uh, Robert Colombo, who from WHO Tunisia sent us an email just to say, you know, thank you. And I wanted to share some of the content. Uh, basically said, you know, you basically, you were able to find pretty much all or close to 100% of the information online. Um, and that we helped to basically, you know, do this in time that they could never have done on their own, right, as well, because we have these volunteers. An interesting point he made was, you're all over um, the, uh, the globe. And in fact, our volunteers, by the way, we have close to 800 volunteers now in about 80 different countries around the world. This is not just a dozen people here and there. These are about 800 volunteers, and we're basically in all time zones. So we do have this kind of 24-hour adva advantage, which our colleagues in Tunisia don't have because they need to go to sleep at some point. So we can continue working around the clock because our workflows are designed in a way that they're predictable and we can follow them. And of course, again, this was all done during the winter break, and we still had 68 volunteers who each spent about an hour of their time. So, you know, roughly about 60 hours if you'd like more, but um, uh, working on this particular project to, to get this done. So that's my public health example. And uh, as promised, I wanted to spend just the last few minutes sharing, you know, some lessons learned on this. And as I was Drafting this list, it was all over the place. It's like this, you know, oh, and this, oh, and this, and we learned this, and we learned this. So it's a bit of a laundry list, and I've tried to cluster them in sort of topics to try and be a bit more coherent and hopefully helpful. And the first I wanted to share was about time. Clearly, people have time. Not a huge amount of time, but if, you know, many people have a little bit of time, that can add up to a heck of a lot, especially because we have these social networking platforms that allow us to aggregate, you know, micro levels of work across uh, 80 different countries, for example. So that really, really adds up. And you know, one statistic that I love to share is from the gaming industry, right? Every week, people play three billion hours worth of games on World of Warcraft. Three billion hours, and apparently, the total number of years played uh, on, on World of Warcraft is something like six million years. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if we actually tapped some of this? and use that for humanitarian response, and maybe use gaming as part of it if, if need be. But I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of what Clay Shirky calls a cognitive surplus, distributed cognition. And if we can start linking these networks, like little, I guess, neurons or whatever you know, the right terms are, and link them, then maybe we have something uh, really interesting there to, to, to leverage. And also in terms of time, you know, people will react whether you like it or not. And that's, that's something that humanitarian organizations don't, uh, are starting to maybe understand, I'm not sure they are is you know, people will launch their own maps. People will get on social media, and so the crowd will do whatever it wants to do rather, regardless of whether you like that or not. So um, that's something to, to keep in mind, and they'll, they tend to act a lot quicker than any other institutions. And then finally, um, on, in terms of time, we need to be able to be more predictable and streamlined, right? This stuff is, is time consuming. So we need to make sure that the, 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 the workflows that we put together and the technologies that we need to start leveraging, which we still haven't, are going to help our volunteers so that we don't need 100 people doing manual media monitoring, right? This is a conference about digital disease detection. I'm sure we're gonna, we definitely are gonna be hearing about machine learning, automated natural language processing, predictive tagging. I need to, this is why I'm going to be here these two days. I, I want to know all this so that maybe we can take some of these technologies and borrow them for a little bit and, and run them on, on some of our projects to see if they can help. And microtasking, I think, is going to be a huge part of sort of the solution. If we can do distributed microtasking, uh, then people only need to spend five, ten minutes and they've still done a lot of work because we can aggregate that work. The second is, is visibility. Um, you know, a lot of, I think part of the reason we're quasi successful and why we, we, we're getting the kind of credibility we do have in the humanitarian space is because we have built a brand. Because we're, we've sort of professionalized in that sense, right? We have our logo, we have our website, we have a very active blog. Um, we share a lot of the work we do in social media. Our workflows are totally public. And it's not about boasting, by the way. We're not tweeting and blogging because they're like, oh, lo you know, look at us, look at us. To be honest, this is incredibly tiring and we have so many other things going on in our lives. So it's, it's a great recipe sometimes for burnout, which we're trying to avoid. But so going on social media and going on the mainstream media, you know, we've, we've been fortunate of getting me, uh, media attention from CNN and others. 
um, is important because volunteers need to feel validated. You, it's, a, it's the best way you can uh, have a volunteer feel credited for her or his own work because otherwise they're sort of behind the scenes, right? Um, so that kind of visibility is really important and the way to attain that is through your own professional networks, speaking at conferences uh, like this, tapping you know, journalists in the mainstream media uh, space, getting an advisory board of high profile respected humanitarians, for example, which we're definitely benefiting from. And, and partnering with people like GIS Corps and with OpenStreetMap to basically get the word out that you know, we're doing this as a collaborative uh, effort. The next is really volunteers themselves because as I showed you that picture, loading volunteers, literally these maps would be completely empty, right? I mean, you can do some automated stuff, but we don't have access to this yet at least really. That really works in a way that I think our humanitarians uh, would be comfortable with. Um, so the volunteers are really, really important. I think one thing that is important is in a way sometimes you think about volunteers and you think about uh, amateurish, right? Like what are the other words that come up when we think about volunteer? Well, what I, we've all realized with this group of 800 people is that there are some of the most skilled individuals and experts in their own domains. They may not have done crisis mapping before, but they're really professionals in one area or something, and they, they're able to learn skills very quickly and quickly become professionals in this space. So we do have dozens and dozens of people who are uh, search and rescue team, um, you know, seasoned experts and so on. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Am I running out of time? All right, uh-oh. Um, let me ask let me add a couple other things, uh, just in terms of tips. Um, keep it informal. We're not a 501c3. We're completely distributed, and we're trying to be as flat as possible. Rewarding volunteers is really important. If somebody is uh, working a lot and has gotten the, the trust of their uh, fellow volunteers, you know, promote them. Ask them if they want to become a coordinator or say, do you want to become a part of the core team? So be attentive to how much time um, volunteers sort of uh, contribute. Use free uh, technology as much as possible. Meet the, meet the volunteers where they are in terms of the technology. If they use Skype, that's where you have to meet them. If they use Facebook, meet them there. Um, in terms of volunteer management incentives, give as much visibility to these individual volunteers as possible. Invite them to, to, to blog on the Standby Task Force blog. Uh, a number of them I've invited to take my place at conferences around the world. So distribute the, the credit and let them take ownership of their, their own network. Uh, give people the benefit of the doubt. They're going to make mistakes. Um, we all do, and don't be too hard on them. Um, you know, we all learn from our mistakes, at least we try. And to, one thing we've realized as well, by the way, is we do have 800 volunteers, but usually it's about 20% who are the core who come back and actually volunteer. And then finally, challenges. I need to take challenges. I know I'm running out of time. Um, I have to choose one. Rogue volunteers. Um, I'll choose that one. Now, to be honest, out of 800, we've had like three or four rogue volunteers. That's not a lot, right? Three or four bad apples and 800, considering that anybody can join, is not bad. But they can suck out the life from you, right? Um, and we've had to deal with, we'd have to deal with that. And very difficult. It's emotionally difficult because you're already doing emotional stuff. And then you have people who are, you know, rogue uh, volunteers. And so, you know, we've developed systems to try and, you know, have a human resources team and also a, a team for uh, psychological support to try and manage some of this as well. Uh, so we're getting, we're getting better at that. Um, and then lastly, I, uh, John sort of referenced this as well, as security, um, privacy, data protection. You know, a number of humanitarian organizations have data protocols and have had for many, many, many years, right? ICRC and so on. Some have made them public, some haven't. But talking to these experts, they're struggling because they don't know how to extend their data, pro uh, data protection uh, protocols to a social media world, to a world where uh, disaster-affected communities are increasingly digital and increasingly the source of content that's important and relevant humanitarian response, and in a world where volunteer networks are also increasingly digital. So what do you do with people who voluntarily share personal and identified information you know, in the social media space, in the public domain? What are the ethical implications of that? What are the security implications of that? If you have any answers, this is a, a serious area of anxiety for me. So um, I'll definitely be here the next two days. And if you have, uh, you know, how you've been struggling or you've overcome some of these challenges, I'm definitely all ears. Thank you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Patrick. That was uh, very inspirational. I think so many lessons uh, to be learned for our community. Um, as we're setting up for the next speaker, um, I just, I guess, I'm, I'm sure there's a million questions and Patrick said he's going to be around, but are there maybe one or two questions for Patrick from the group? No? 
I, ha I just have actually one question for you, actually, which is, you know, the translation to health, because in a crisis mapping situation, um, it's a crisis. People are energized because they want to help. It's something acute. In the health field, we have this situation of incentives in sort of baseline issues or events that are highly focused in one particular area. To get huge volunteers reporting in the health sector where it's not this sort of immediate, you know, in a pandemic, it's easy enough to get people engaged. But what about at other times of the year where it's probably less acute? I mean, do you have any advice as we're trying to build up volunteers in, in the health sector? Really, thanks for the easy question. Um, well, first of all, I'd love to help out if this is an area that maybe you're thinking about sort of you know, developing like the equivalent of a, a health standby volunteer task force. I mean, we've got a lot of work posts that we, we can share and, and lessons learned. Um, for me, I, I, I go back to the example of Wikipedia. There are some of the most interesting, arcane, weird articles on Wikipedia, the most like little detail of about a particular screw in a particular car from the 1960s in Russia, right? People are interested in, in, in many different things, and I think you'd be surprised if you're able to have a good way of presenting yourself, a public way of presenting yourself, making it clear that this is, this is a, a, not a, a circus initiative, but it's actually real. There are public health experts who are backing this. It's got legitimacy. I, I would be surprised if you didn't find a handful of people from around the world who are interested in a particular type of a disease or a particular type uh, or a particular town in Uganda or, or something. So I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, it's been a, an ongoing experiment for us, but wouldn't underestimate the size of the crowd and the variety and the, 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 the great variety of interest that this crowd uh, has uh, as connected with the cloud and all that stuff. So, but I'd love to work with you on this. Thank you.